plays my crazy 80s music. Forgive me. Sorry, I'm a child of the 80s and the 90s. So welcome back. Um, we're going to be doing nervous tissue today. We finished up tissues in general. We touched upon nervous tissue just a little bit, and then we finished up skin on the lectures. So that's where we should be at this point. You should have a general working knowledge of cells. You should have a general working knowledge of ions to understand this lecture. And if you don't, I would just sort of pause the tape and go back and review a little bit, okay? And as always, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to get back to you, okay? So we're going to be talking about nervous tissue. I'm going to keep you close on the PowerPoints for most of this lecture, if not all of it, because I have a lot of really good pictures in there for you to review. All right, so I'm going to zoom you on in. Nervous tissue, chapter 11. These are pictures of nerve cells. I just thought they were kind of cool in supporting cells. And we're going to get into the different names of those supporting cells because don't forget that nerve cells are a living tissue, excuse me, and they need sustenance and wastes carried away. So they need to be taken care of just like we do. Here's the transverse or horizontal plane cutting through the skull. You can see the openings at the center. This is a CAT scan. Okay, so this isn't a real cut. This is an imaginary cut that we talked about. And the brain should look symmetrical bilaterally, and it does not in this picture. You can see the openings in the center. On the right there is actually pushed in a little bit. This patient has a tumor, unfortunately, in the nerve tissue. Now take a minute and look at this and see if this looks normal to you. Think for a second about what plane or view would create this through the brain, transverse or horizontal. And you can see that once again, the spaces that are in the center, those real white appearing ones are actually pushed to the side. Once again, this is a tumor. This is an MRI showing a tumor in the brain. This is a PET scan, which actually shows the function or the phys um, physiology of the brain and the uptake of substances in the brain, okay? This is going to be another MRI. This is going to be a little bit lower down. Once again, think for just a second about what plane creates this. It to be a transverse or horizontal plane. And you can see that it's at the level of the eyes in the midbrain. Starting to move into the midbrain there, okay? So moving down to the brain, you could start to see that the brain has white and gray matter, and that's an important concept that we're going to be talking about in this lecture. Now, what planar view would create this? Mid-sagittal, good, or sagittal. And once again, you could see the real white matter in the center. That's actually called the corpus callosum that we'll get into in the next lecture. And the corpus callosum is important because your brain is essentially two lobes and those two lobes are connected. You've probably heard the theory of how the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. So there are actually two separate hemispheres that control opposite sides of the body. But there's also specific functions that are unilateral or one-sided, such as speech. Okay, Speech is on the left side of the brain. So in order for the right side of the brain to understand what's happening, there needs to be a communication between the two halves. This white structure that you see the arrow pointing at is the corpus callosum. That corpus callosum helps the two sides of the brain to communicate. Okay. Now what view would create this? Frontal or coronal, good. You can see those two lobes essentially of the brain connected by the corpus callosum in the very center. See that little like evil looking face it looks like? The two eyes and the long mouth there in the center. You can imagine that, okay? The corpus callosum is actually connecting the two halves of the brain there. In the bottom real frilly part is actually the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is gonna coordinate our movements. Okay. Another transverse or horizontal, you can see that's through the eyeballs and it's labeling all the different parts of the brain that we'll start to learn about. And this is another transverse or horizontal view. And you can see on the right side, there's some sort of tumor growth in there. Okay, that or some lack, lack of blood, I'm not quite sure, necrosis or death, okay? So, 
the whole concept with the nervous system, and this sounds so simple for such a complex system, is bringing information in, and you can see at the top there, that's what that represents. So sensation from the head, neck, and face, but also from the body and from the organs as well. That sensory information is going to come in. It's going to be processed in what's called interneurons. And those interneurons can mostly, they're mostly in the brain, but they can also be in the spinal cord. And then there'll be an effect. There'll be a motor effect, and that's representative of the lower arrow showing that motor response. You know, he senses in the upper portion that he's thirsty and the motor response is to take a drink, okay? And that's the whole premise behind the sensation and the motor of our body, the whole control of our body. It's sensation and responding to that sensation, okay? The brain integrates all that sensation. The brain is not only gonna tell you there's water in front of you. It'll tell you that it's in front of you, its location and what that water will do for you. It's an integrator. It brings in all that information, processes it, and gives us a whole picture. So organization of the nervous system, we've got central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system is going to be brain and spinal cord. We talked about that when we talked about cavities. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's in that dorsal body cavity. Peripheral nervous system consists of two major groupings of nerves. Spinal nerves are going to feed the extremities the torso and the legs. Oh, the arms, the torso, and the legs, I should say, all the extremities and the torso. Cranial nerves primarily are going to serve the head and neck region. There's one that actually will go down to the abdominal organs, excuse me, okay? So peripheral nervous system is gonna con consist of spinal nerves, which go to extremities and torso, and cranial nerves, which go to head and neck, okay, with one exception. How many things does the nervous system control? Holy crow, like everything, right? Everything. We have information coming in, which comes in on sensory or afferent nerves. I have a little mnemonic I'm gonna give you in just a second for this. Information out is motor or efferent nerves. We're constantly maintaining homeostasis unless we have a disease process, okay? What would the disease process be in the brain? Well, there's multiple things that can go wrong, okay? But in a normal state of existence, we're gonna maintain homeostasis constantly by this information coming in and information going out, okay? So the nervous system has two principal functional parts, somatic and autonomic. Somatic is your regular movement, your skeletal voluntary movement. Autonomic, I like to think of as automatic. Autonomic, automatic. Automatic is going to be all the automatic functions that happen in our body. Digestion, um, breathing, respiration, blood pressure, heart rate. And there are two groupings of that autonomic division. They're sympathetic and parasympathetic. We're going to take a whole chapter and talk about autonomic. Sympathetic, just a brief little introduction, is fight or flight. So if a bear were to come into the room and you had to defend yourself, your sympathetic nervous system would kick into play and you would go into fight or flight. Parasympathetic is going to be rest and relaxation. It's when we digest, it's when we go to the bathroom, it's when we recuperate, okay? But there's specific things that we need to know about those two. We'll get into those in the future, okay? I don't know if this chart, this is everything we just talked about. Some people like this chart, some people don't. So take a look at it and realize this is everything that we've talked about. If it helps you, great. If it doesn't, don't. Okay. So Dasip and Vamoa. This is so silly, but it's a good mnemonic to help you to remember where the sensory and where the motor nerves are. I'm going to bring you out to the whiteboard for a minute here. Okay. Oops. There. Sorry about that. I don't know what quite happened there. Dossip and Vamoa. The thing that we need to understand is that if I do a cut through my brain or a cut through my spinal cord and you look down inside, okay, you are going to be looking at the cord, okay? The front of the cord, so if I were to draw a picture right across, 
the front of the cord, which would be the anterior, the ventral part of the cord, is going to control motor. The posterior of the cord is going to have sensory information coming in. Same thing with the brain. The posterior of the brain brings information in. The motor is on the anterior of the brain. Okay? So I made up a silly mnemonic to help you to remember which part has which sensory or motor. Okay? It's DOSIP and VAMOA. So we already know the motor and we already know the sensory. Okay? So sensory is in the posterior of the cord. Another word for posterior is dorsal. So the dorsal of the cord receives the sensory information. Why is it like that? It just is. That's the way we're structured. Okay. The motor component is going to be in the anterior of the cord, also known as ventral. Okay. So one more easy step. Motor is going to be outgoing information. Just think about it for a minute. We think we want to move our arm, we send outgoing information to our muscles. Sensory brings information in from our external environment to the brain. The only thing that's new is the words afferent. An afferent is going to be that sensory incoming information. Efferent is motor outgoing information. Okay. So silly little mnemonic, but it'll definitely score you a couple points, at least in this class. And I bet you'll see it again in the future. So DOSIP and VAMOA, where motor control is and where sensory information goes in the cord and also in the brain. Okay, fix my hair while I'm looking at it. Okay, so DOSIP and VAMOA. So I'm going to bring you back in. So sensory information from somatic or body structures as well as visceral or organ structures. Okay. Same thing with a motor component. We're going to have motor control over our muscles as well as our digestion, our heart rate, etc., or those autonomic structures. Okay. So sensory information from the body and organs and motor control of the body and organs as well. Okay. Neurons are nerve cells, interchangeable. They're going to communicate with electrical impulses called action potentials. That's a big concept we're going to talk about. Okay. These action potentials, this is just a little introduction, we're going to get all into it, function just like wires do in electrical um, lights. Okay. If you just took physics, you know that when we talk about lights, it's the movement of electrons or charged particles. When we talk about nerves functioning, we are also talking about electrical impulses or charged particles moving down that nerve. Okay? So, and we're going to get all into that, so don't worry about it. We have sensory nerves, we've talked about that, or neurons. We have motor nerves that control motor. But we also have interneurons, and these interneurons are going to be the neurons in between the sensory and the motor. Okay? So nerve structure, we talked about this in lab already. The cell body has a nucleus. Dendrites are going to be branches that receive information and bring it towards that cell body. Axon is going to be a single branch leaving the cell body, sending information away from the cell body. And the axon is where the action potential will travel down. Types of cells. So there's nerve cells or neurons, which we've talked about. And there's what's called neuroglia, or some people call it glial cells. And these neuroglia or glial cells are supporting cells that feed and nourish and protect nerve cells. They're very important. Okay? We've got different groupings of these glial cells. We're going to talk about the ones in the central nervous system first. Okay? So microglial cells are glial cells that act as macrophages. Microglial cells, the first one we see there, act as macrophages. 
So if we have an infection that gets into the central nervous system, these microglial cells turn into macrophages and phagocyze or eat up those substances. Macroglial cells are not macrophages. Macroglial cells consist of three types of cells called astrocytes, epidermal cells, and oligodendrocytes. I think. Sorry, I'm just looking ahead. Oh, I thought that I had notes about it. Okay, so let's talk about these. Astrocytes are going to support and nourish nerve cells, and they also form the blood brain barrier. barrier excuse me. So astrocytes feed and nourish nerve cells, and they help to form the blood-brain barrier. Okay. Epidymal cells line all the ventricles. Okay. Epidymal cells line the ventricles. So anywhere we have cerebral spinal fluid, even all the way down the cord, we have epidymal cells lining. And they help to um, move the cerebral spinal fluid. They actually have cilia on top. So epidymal cells line ventricles. Oligodendrocytes are going to produce a substance called myelin. We're going to get into myelin a little bit later, but let me just briefly describe to you what myelin is. Myelin is super, super important for the functioning of axons. Myelin is a fatty substance that's located on axons. And you can actually see the bottom picture there. It shows a nerve. And around that nerve fiber, around that axon, you have little pockets of myelin. It's almost like the equation I give is, um, you ever see a pretzel, a hot dog wrapped in a pretzel? They have them in Auntie Annie's. So there's the hot dog and you've got all the way around it, the pretzel um, forming like a little sheath around the hot dog. If you were to take a whole bunch of them and line down a really big hot dog, you would have what looks like the myelin sheath, these little pockets of fat around an axon. And the, the, the only job that they have is to speed up transmission. They speed up that action potential moving down the axon. So the myelin is a fatty sheath around the axons that helps to speed up transmission down the axon. Okay? Now, in the central nervous system, that myelin is made by oligodendrocytes. So the only job for those oligodendrocytes is to make myelin in the central nervous system. It'll speed up the speed of transmission of nervous signal. In the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells makes the myelin. Okay, Schwann cells makes the myelin. That's an important difference because if we damage a nerve in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells will actually form a sheath around that damaged nerve and allow it to repair. The thing about nerves is we do not create new nerves when we get older. So if we damage nerves and we don't actually have them surgically fixed in the peripheral nervous system, they're damaged forever. If we damage nerves in the central nervous system, they'll never repair because those oligodendrocytes will not help the nerves to repair in the central nervous system, unlike the Schwann cells. So some interesting research that they're doing is they'll take Schwann cells and implant them in the, in the central nervous system to try to facilitate the healing of those nerves in the central nervous system. Okay. So Schwann cells make myelin in the peripheral nervous system and they will help a nerve to repair. Satellite cells help to feed and nourish the nerve cells in the peripheral nervous system. Okay. So here is a picture of those satellite cells and also the Schwann cells forming, forming excuse me, that myelin sheath, those little rolls down the axon to facilitate or speed up that action potential. Okay, so neurons, and we, we just actually talked about this. You are born with all the nerves, except for a few rare exceptions. Um, there's some replication after you're born. But you get to a point when you um, are early, early, early in your development that nerves will stop replicating, okay? So you have the nerves that you're going to have forever. That's why they have longevity. They are amitotic though. Now A is a prefix that means without. Mitosis means replication. Okay, so these nerve cells are amitotic. They will not replicate. Once again, there's an exception, but we're going to go with the basic rule. They are also metabolic, highly, highly metabolic. They need tons of glucose and tons of oxygen to create energy. 
That's why you have brain death if you have a cutoff of oxygen because it's so metabolic. You also will have, if you don't have enough glucose, your body will reserve all the glucose you have for the brain if stores are getting low. And the other organs will actually start to use fat. It's called glucose sparing. That's why people, when they don't have enough glucose, start to get a little loopy because their brains are not functioning properly. Okay, so highly metabolic. Cell body is also known as perikaryon or soma. It has no centrioles. If you remember centrioles from mitosis, centrioles are going to form an anchoring point point for that mitotic spindle for cells to replicate. So if there are no centrioles, there is no mitosis. I won't ask you about the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, it's it's called nissel bodies, and the cell body, um, and of course that'll be where proteins are made. Okay. Nuclei and ganglia, though. So here's a little concept I want to talk about. Put on your thinking caps, because I've grown a little bit off notes here. When you are looking at the brain, we're going to cut open a whole bunch of sheep's brains in the next week or so. You're going to see areas that look white. You're going to see areas that look gray. Okay. Now, if you think about the nerve cell, we've got the cell body and dendrites, and then we've got the axon with the myelin on it. Okay. Myelin looks white. Myelin looks white. So the axon is going to look white because it's covered with fat. So when you're looking at a brain, you'll see areas of gray matter, which is going to primarily be cell bodies, and then you'll see areas of white matter, which will primarily be axons. The gray area, guys, is going to process information because that's where the cell bodies are. The white area which is where the axons are, transmits information, okay? It's an important concept. When you cut open the brain, you'll see areas of gray matter, little collections of round collections of gray matter. Those are called nuclei. They're collections of cell bodies in the brain that process information. When we have collections of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, they're called ganglia, okay? So nuclei are collections of cell bodies in the central nervous system. Ganglia are collections of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Processes. Now, when we have collections of axons in the central nervous system, they are called tracks. When we have collections of axons in the central nervous system, they are called tracks. On these tracks, we will send and receive information, right? We're transmitting information. In the peripheral nervous system, all of our nerves are made up of axons, right? So nerves are made up of axons. The dendrites tend to be, they can also be in that white matter, but primarily they're gonna be in the gray matter, okay? Those axons are going to be either in the tracks, white matter, or also along nerves. Now, neurotransmitters is going to be a whole other thing that we're going to talk about. Okay, so we're going off of processes. We talked about the processes. We're talking now about neurotransmitters, and we're going to get more about, you know, into them in the future. A nerve's whole purpose is to send information to a receptor. Okay. That nerve needs to talk to that receptor. So let's talk about the nerves that go to my biceps muscle that's going to flex my arm. Okay that nerve has to somehow communicate to that muscle. It does it through what's called a neurotransmitter. There are a whole bunch of different types of neurotransmitters. I'm gonna introduce them to you as we get to them, okay? So the nerve or the axon will come down near the muscle. There's a little space between the nerve and the muscle, and through that space needs to travel neurotransmitters, okay? And we'll get into that in the future. Now, organelles, we're not going to get into the different organelles in a cell body, but there are different organelles that we'll see in the nerve cell body like we see in other organs, okay? So here are the dendrites. We've got the cell body with the nucleus. That area, the expansile area that starts to narrow towards the axon is called the axon hillock. That's going to be important because that's where nerve signals start. And then the nerve signal will travel down to the right all the way to the end of the axon, okay? You can see 
those Schwann cells, and those Schwann cells actually make the myelin. So within one of those bubbles is a Schwann cell that's wrapped around and around and around and formed layers and layers of myelin or fat, and the Schwann cell actually gets pushed out to the outside. Okay. The other thing I want to show you on this picture is the space that's called the node of Ranvier. Um, it's kind of cut off there. It's the bottom right node of it's R-A-N-V-I-E-R. -E you can probably see it on your computer screen, hopefully. Okay. Now what happens with an action potential is it basically, it doesn't jump, but it, it starts at the node of Ron V. It starts at the axon hillock. It goes quickly through the first um, myelin sheath to the next node of Ron V. A. Then quickly through the myelin sheath to the next node of Ron V. A. And it kind of, it doesn't jump, but it moves quickly through the myelin sheath, so it speeds up transmission. It actually will happen at the nodes of Ron VA. So it goes bup, 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 almost jumping. Okay? And you can see how that, if it's skipping all the myelinated areas, it's going to make its trip much shorter and much quicker. Okay? So myelin sheath are going to be in segments. It helps to conduct impulses rapidly. It's only on axons. Schwann cells created in the peripheral nervous system. And you could see in this picture how the Schwann cell wraps around and wraps around and wraps around. Okay. It's formed by oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. Okay. The neural lemma is the outer layer. We aren't going to get into that. Don't worry about that. But the nodes of Ranvier are the spaces in between. Those are important. Okay. Schwann cells wrap around, create that myelin sheath on the peripheral nervous system, okay. The neural lemma is going to the peripheral bur bur uh, bulge of the Schwann cells, cytoplasm on the outside of that myelin sheath. Once again, I'm not going to get into that. Okay. Forms those nodes of Ron VA. So you've got those spaces in between. There's a bare area of the axon to which that action potential can jump to. Okay. You can have little axon collaterals stick out, little branches sticking out from those nodes of Ron VA, can they innervate the surrounding structures? Okay. I don't know why I put another picture in, but here it is, if this helps you. Okay. So myelin sheath in the central nervous system is going to be formed by those oligodendrocytes, not on the whole cells. There are nodes of Ron VA present as well. There's not a neural lemma. Um, when you get to really thin fibers, they're unmyelinated. But there's differences in the myelination anyway through all the nerves, and we'll get into that a little bit in the future. Okay. Here's a picture of the oligodendrocyte. It has multiple processes creating that myelin sheath on the axons in the central nervous system. Okay. White matter and gray matter, we talked about this. So myelinated fibers are going to be white. They're going to be axons. They transmit information. Gray matter are going to be cell bodies that are un unmyelinated. They're going to process information. It's a big difference. Okay, Gray matter is going to be doing all the thinking. White matter is doing all the transmitting. Okay, So big difference. This is what it's going to look like when we cut up in the sheep's brains. We're going to have white matter and gray matter. Okay. Different gray matter does different things, and we'll talk about that when we get into the future, okay? So white matter versus gray matter. White matter is the messenger. Gray matter is the controller, okay? So classification. Functionally, let's jump to that first, and then I'm going to pull you out and, and draw a quick picture for you. Functionally, we've got sensory nerves, that whole DASF thing that we talked about. Sensory, incoming you know, afferent, they're in the posterior of the cord or the dorsal of the cord. They tend to be unipolar. I'll talk to you about what unipolar is in just a second. Motor is going to be multipolar. Multipolar nerves are going to be the majority of the nerves in the body. Once again, they come from the ventral, they're outgoing, afferent of the cord, and they're efferent. Now, there are also interneurons. They're going to shuttle signals through the central nervous system, these interneurons can be between a sensory and a motor nerve in the cord or also in the brain, depending on where we need that information sent. Okay, so that's a real gross generalization of what they are. Structurally, though, let's talk about these. Multipolar is going to be the majority of the nerves that we talk about. 
Multipolar means that there's multiple projections. Okay. We're going to have the cell body. We're going to have multiple dendrites coming in. And then one axon going out. Okay? Multipolar. Bipolar, we're going to see these. These are like 99% of our nerves. Okay? They're like 99%. That says 99% if you can't read it. So bipolar is going to have a projection on one side and a projection on the other side. We're going to see these in the eyes. Okay? We're going to see these in the eyes, and that's the only place I can think of really. Okay? Bipolar. Unipolar is going to be a sensory nerve. Unipolar is a really odd little nerve that has one projection coming out of the cell body and one side is going to, for our purposes, be a dendrite, and one side is going to be an axon. Okay? So unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar. Okay? The majority of what we're going to talk about is going to be multipolar. Okay? All right. Let me see if there's anything else. So reflexes, if you do that plain old, that knee reflex, you know, if I sit down, I have a very strong knee reflex, you can't see it, but whack, I bang my knee and shoo, my leg straightens, okay? What's happening there is my sensory nerves from my knee are bringing information right into the cord and I'm automatically having a response, a motor response. Because our body senses that that muscle is being overstretched, and its response is to shorten it, to protect it, okay? So if we go back to the notes here, okay, those reflexes, the information coming in, sensory into the posterior of the cord, there's an interneuron right in the cord that has a motor effect immediately. Because once again, reflexes are protective. We want a quick, efficient response, okay? Neurophysiology. I'm going to finish the rest of this lecture in the next um, in the next sequence, but I'll leave you with a little bit of garbage music. All right. Have a great one, guys. Email me with any questions, please. Thank you so much.